And ladies and gentlemen, he's one of the all-time greats, my buddy, Mr. John Wayne. You're listening to the John Wayne Gritcast with me, Ethan Wayne. The hell I was. We're talking all about the life and legacy of my father. John Wayne. Mr. John Wayne. John Wayne is the United States of America. Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go. Hi. This is a really fun episode of the John Wayne Gritcast. Today we're going to go to southern Utah and visit with a guy named Matt who has a very popular YouTube channel called Matt's Off-Road Recovery. Matt and his crew record their adventures helping people who get stuck on some pretty crazy off-road adventures. We're also lucky enough to go on an off-road expedition with them in their famous Jeep called the Banana. Now the Banana served Matt well for over 20 years but recently went in for a major overhaul and uh, the day we got there was the day they were unloading the banana and we got to go on some pretty crazy trails if you know anything about off-roading we did a 7-7 trail if you'd like to watch the podcast and also get some behind the scenes uh, footage of our adventures with matt and the crew head over to our youtube channel john wayne gritcast on youtube okay it's kind of a different podcast for us. We're out on the trails with uh, the crew from Matt's Off-Road Recovery. Uh, when I first saw the show, I, I thought, one, it's in the area where John Wayne made a lot of his films. Two, it's uh, got a lot of family involved and uh, also shows a lot of um, practical skills and self-reliance. So... I thought it would be cool to have a minute with them. And with that, I'll introduce you to Lizzie. <laughs> and Rudy. Hey. <laughs> and Trevor. Hey. And Hefe. How's it going? And last but not least, Matt. Hello. So, like, we have no agenda. We're just stoked to be out here and we kind of wanted to share you with our audience. Um, I sort of went over with you, like, why I thought, you know, you're like, why do you want to talk to us? Well, one, this is kind of John Wayne land. I mean, I think in the yeah. 40s when they made Stagecoach, it sort of introduced this area to a lot of people visually. It, it's a comment we get in our videos. They're like, this looks like a John Wayne movie. Really? Yeah. That's cool. cool. Yeah, because when I watch it at home, I'm like, hmm, I wonder where that is. Oh, St. George area. Yeah, my mom always talks about St. George. Not pleasantly. Yeah. She's like, your father took me to this place. There was nothing there. <laughs> and she had to drive my brother Patrick home from here. I showed you that picture of her in front of the Utah yeah, sign. Yeah. So I guess my dad had some nice car, you know, whatever it was, it was probably the mid fifties. And uh, she loads my brother Patrick in, who's not her son. It's from my dad's first wife. My mother's my dad's third wife. And they start driving back to uh, Los Angeles. And my brother's about 16, and he looks up, and he goes, all I see is headlights and cars coming directly towards us. My mom is from Peru, and she got on the freeway going the wrong way oh, no. against traffic. So that was their first sort of time together. But for this, we want to just go back to the start. Like, how the heck did you get, you know, did you grow up here? You, is I this your area? I basically grew up here. I moved... My family moved to Hurricane in 1982. So I would have been, maybe 1980. I was five years old. Yeah, it would have been 1980. And How old was I in 1980? Since. I would have been 62, 72. What's 80? I'm 18? 18. 18 or 19? Yeah. So you guys moved here. My dad had just died. Yeah, yeah. a long time ago. So you guys, yeah. you grew up here, went to school here? Yeah, yep. The whole area. Spend a lot of time out here um, on ATVs, and I had a sand rail. I built a couple of sand rails. I never did any of the Jeep stuff, the four-wheel drive stuff, um, until more recently. But I do at least I did at least know all the area. So it was for doing off-road recovery. Knowing the area is more important than anything. I get that question, like what kind of mapping systems do I use, and it's it's up here. I, I, if I can talk to you and you can give me some landmarks, tell me where you were, where you're trying to go, it, I can usually get in and, and get pretty close. And it kind of reminds me of being a kid. Uh, my dad was older when I was born, so he was 56 when I was born. 
and half our life was spent in some remote location because he'd be making a western so whether it was down in Mexico or around here Colorado New Mexico I was had pretty free reign like I had a lot of uh, freedom uh, nobody was watching over me and I was allowed to jump on a horse and ride off into the trails and he'd just give you practical knowledge like I had beef jerky a pocket knife a lighter and then I was pretty much free to go and I can remember many times you know just kind of keeping an eye on the sun and going up on a hilltop and looking around and I'd look for the in those days they used reflectors for the sun these big like they look like Reynolds wrap things you know and it's like oh, okay make my way back there and that's one thing that I I sort of got from your show the first time I saw it I'm like uh, you, you talked about how you didn't really you weren't crazy about school it wasn't holding your interest yeah, school did not hold my it, interest it didn't at hold all. mine either it, some did when I'd go on location with my father and this big guy who played a heavy in a lot of the movies Tom Hennessy was my tutor he was like 6'8 320 pounds just this massive man and he made learning very interesting to me and uh, I enjoyed that but when I got back home especially in high school didn't yeah didn't I, I never attention. had anything against learning I just I, I really struggled with the school structure so you know I, I thought that was pretty cool that you know you had interests you had uh, desire to do things to learn things you you know you educated yourself you, you found a direction it was more uh, practical knowledge that that led you to to work in a career and I think you started in did you start in roofing um, I started in plumbing um, that was like my first trade that I worked in and I picked it up quick it wasn't it wasn't really difficult for me and I actually I probably could have made a career out of that I ended up moving away from that and my friend owned a roofing company and it was just easy to get into that and I did I was in the roofing industry for 12 years so 10 years as an employee and then the last two years as a business owner I see and then one day I woke up and I'm like, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. And I sold my business. Um, the interest that I had in the business, I was 50% owner in. And then uh, I didn't even know what I was going to do. When I made the decision to sell it, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I wasn't worried about it. So. Oh, so you didn't know you were going towing? No, I had no idea. You just knew you were done with that? Mm hmm And, and it was terrifying for Jamie, my wife. She... She was not excited about that news because I made the decision without her, which is not a good idea. <laughs> but, um, and I, Jamie, if you haven't watched Matt's Off Road Recovery, Jamie's really a trooper. I mean, Lizzie, Jamie. Yeah, I've been married to Jamie for 19 years, so she's getting pretty used to my pivots. Well, she seems like a wonderful person, and mm -hmm. she knows how to oh, drive a car. Yep. And she doesn't shy away from getting out here with you, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so that was... So how did you end up, you, you leave roofing, and then how's towing come in? So it's it's a story, I mean, it's a simple story, but it's Were you still true. here? Still yep. hurricane? Yep, still a hurricane. So every Sunday afternoon, there's always this big gathering at Lizzie's family, and she has a very big, close, massive family. And there's usually anywhere from 20 to 60 people show up at their at uh, her Lizzie's grandparents' house every Sunday afternoon. And so I'm just sitting there and everybody's like, you sold your company? What are you doing? And I actually sold it to Lizzie's uncle. Like he was my partner. So I sold my interest to him. And everybody's just like, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, I don't know. And Jamie's like trying to hold back tears because things were going pretty good for us and now all of a sudden I just cut the paychecks off and so um, Lizzie's uncle Daniel said you should get into towing because I just got my car impounded and it cost me $200 to get it out and I'm like I could do towing and he says oh the guy that impounded my car is selling his business Wow so I called him on Monday um, made a deal with him on Thursday and started towing and the off-road recovery, which is what most people know me for, that came a little bit slower because I would get the calls to do off-road recovery and I didn't know how to do them. And I'd try to use my tow trucks. And all of the people in the tow industry is like, don't do off-road recovery. Let 
you know, let other people deal with that. Let them handle it. You can't make any money doing it. You'll ruin your trucks. And they were right. It's really hard on tow trucks to get them out here and to do work with them. So it was just a problem that kept coming up where I've got these jobs to do and I can't do them. And I would still figure out how to do them, but it was costing me money. It was, I was ruining equipment doing it. And so talking to friends and, and other people that were in the off-roading community, um, we got some good advice from them to get a Cherokee, um, start using kinetic ropes, to learn what those are all about. And, and from there, the, the stuff that I was already good at, the problem solving and the thinking outside of the box and, and making it work, even if you don't have the right tools, the right equipment, figure out how to make it work. And that fit really well into just getting a Cherokee and a kinetic energy rope and just start doing things with it that are unexpected. You also have, you know, you have this troop, right? You have this, I mean, in, in, in my life, I had my dad and he had his mentor, John Ford, uh, and they had this thing called the John Ford Stock Company. And it was a bunch of, uh, you know, it was basically John Wayne and then all the supporting actors that would work in film and, and they, they worked in, in different films and different genres, you know, from The Quiet Man to Rio Grande and, you know, the Cavalry Trilogy to, to all of them. And, and it was like a troupe that went together and people loved John Wayne, but they also loved the other characters in his John Ford stock company. And, and right away within a couple of videos, you know, I realized, gosh, you, know, you, you got Matt out here doing something unique and including a bunch of people who themselves become characters in your show and they become important to us as viewers. And I, I just saw a lot of similarities, um, whether it's your son, Rudy, who, I mean, Rudy, how long do you say this thing's been going on? Two years, three years? Just about three years. Because you literally looked like a kid in some of the videos and now you look like a stud. So there's like a, a big transformation there. I was gonna say Goldie Hawn, but. <laughs> It's nothing wrong with Goldie Hawn. Uh, and then, you know, somebody like Lizzie, well, you're, she's 19 years old. She can weld, drive the off-road cars, do recoveries. I mean, this is, this is, I don't know if you guys know it, but as an older guy looking back, who grew up around a lot of men with practical experiences who were, who were out working on projects in remote locations, this is valuable information that will stay with you forever, whether you end up living in New York City, or you know some someplace super remote you, you guys have practical knowledge that a lot of the world doesn't get anymore it's just as we get citified this goes away i don't know if anybody looked at jade's face coming up the hill but there were some good <laughs> looks <laughs> it, that leads me into something else uh i grew up with a with an extremely famous father and uh, I was on TV myself, but coming to you guys, I'm coming in as, as a total unknown fan. Like, I have my coffee in the morning, I have my toast, watching you guys. I know Hefe and Lizzie and Rudy and you and Trevor and, you know, the whole crew. But I show up on your doorstep and like, when I first walked into the yard, it just struck me. Oh my gosh, I'm, I don't know how I'm gonna be received here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you're coming in in a in a totally different uh, situation, coming in as a fan. Yeah, coming in as a fan, and that and it it poses problems for me because um, I I had some social adjustments, like I was socially unadjusted in other ways, and so like remembering people's names and and recognizing faces, but not, not, not being able to put them anywhere. But now I have people coming up to me and I have to guess whether they're coming up to me because we have some, you know, something we're doing in the community on Tuesday, or if they're coming up to me as a fan and then driving something like the Morver, we were in Reno and I got honked and waved and this lady's like, pull over, pull over. I'm like, okay. So I pull over and I'm, and I start talking about the channel. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I just want a picture of your car. Oh wow! So that's funny. so it 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 can put you in interesting yeah, situations. Yeah, you don't like know. That. And, and as a kid, as John Wayne's son, I we didn't grow up in Hollywood. As soon as I was born, we moved down to Newport Beach, which was a small beach town. And half my life was on location somewhere like this, you know, with a camp set up. Uh, so I didn't realize that I had 
sort of a John Wayne billboard behind me that a lot of people knew who I was. I just didn't, I didn't grow up that way. So it's, it's an odd situation to find yourself in. Yeah, and I, and I wonder, what, you know, what effect that's going to have on my kids and stuff. Like, it's, it's something that I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know how to treat that. Yeah. Because they're, they're getting it at school, their kids, the other kids at school, their friends watch it. Or if their friends don't, at least their friends' parents watch it. Um, you know, you'll have kids drawing pictures in art class of the banana or wearing their wearing their gear. I don't I don't know how that I don't know. I mean well, you would have a better insight. You you than, should stay you, you're a pretty well grounded person and you know as I look at Lizzie and Rudy and everybody, they all seem pretty well grounded too. That the thing that happens is sometimes, you know, the season ends or the, the series ends and then something else comes up that's more popular and you might get a feeling of being left out. And you can't connect that to your self-worth. You're still the, the same people, whether you're on YouTube or not. And you know, you can't let that be the main focus of your life. Yeah. That's the tough part for people sometimes, yeah. is if that goes away. But there are other things that will come in, other, other directions that you'll go in life. But you seem like a pretty well-rounded crew. You well, know, you, I'm, you glad we, I'm glad we seem that way. <laughs> You're not a person who, who takes things for granted, uh, whether it's uh, your channel or the people that you work with. But, you know, it's um, our little organization has grown from two people to 20 recently, and and just thinking about how to interact properly with, uh, you know, men, women. Older people, younger people, there's a little bit of an art to getting through that. And before I took over John Wayne, I was pretty independent. I sort of ran my own life and I didn't have to worry about how I interacted with certain people or not. I just had to go do projects and that's how I did it. But now with Jade, we've got some, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't want to say it's challenging, but it's interesting to find the right way to communicate because I may think I'm saying something a certain way but it's they're not yeah. used to hearing if it. i think it in my head i assume everybody knows mm -hmm. it and that's a problem that's that gets us that can get us a little conflict because I'll, I'll be like well why isn't everybody on the same page as me and they're like well you haven't communicated it well, one oh. thing that i know with my dad and i noticed that you guys do it too because you're you're you're, you're project oriented you know whether you guys are building or you're on a recovery there's a mission and so everybody has to chip in to get that mission done, even if it's just picking up tools and organizing stuff and cleaning up. No. And so if you come from a background like that and then you work with a, a younger person or a person who hasn't grown up in that situation, you've got to find a way to say you, you got to pay attention and it's not just this. I may be unclogging the toilet and then having a meeting with somebody important. Like we do everything here. Everybody kicks in. Nothing's off the table. So keep your eyes peeled, pay attention, and be involved. Yeah, and we, and we're we don't even know what we're getting into on a lot of these jobs. We don't have good information, and and that's why everybody's got to be on their toes because we've got to get this done. We don't want to be here all night. That's a, another uniquely American. What do you call it? A character trait or quality? The ability to. Uh, be flexible and yeah. pick a different direction or pick a different avenue to the outcome. Um, I was speaking with a guy that runs a very large Chinese corporation and they were interested in John Wayne because he has all these managers that he wants to turn loose. And he said, we're great at learning things. Like we're the best at learning things, but we just learn in this little vertical. And if something happens out here, everything comes to a grinding halt. Uh -huh. We're not good as a as a, whatever you want to call it, we're just not used to pivoting like that. You know, you're not allowed to talk back in class or certain things that, that you're just not used to doing, questioning, pivoting, whatever. And so John Wayne represented a lot of that sort of self-reliance and the ability to deal with different situations on screen. And you guys are doing the same thing because you're coming, these are real life situations where you have to fix something or, you know, 
find a, a battery and snip a wire and use it to roll down the windows in a car that's not completely hooked up yet. Yeah. These are things that are, it's just practical knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Lizzie's going to meet a handsome young man one day who's going to be filing his fingernails and he won't know how to change the tire and he'll be like, you know what, maybe we're not right for each other. <laughs> you change that tire and get home. <laughs> In films, we'd have, you know, you'd try to set something up for a, like a wagon wreck or a horse fall or something like that. And, you know, inevitably, sometimes things don't go as planned. And certainly on your channel, I'm sure you have a lot of instances where things don't go as planned. For example, the guy driving that razor up to get the airplane. Oh, and yeah. He wasn't a, a super athletic individual, and it looked like we were going to lose him. Yeah, that was, high. that was scary. And the, and the, the way I had to deal with that, I didn't deal with that rollover until the next day because I knew I couldn't. Because we had we were in a high stakes situation, right? And I had Ed in the Jeep with me and we had to get this airplane off and we were definitely needed to get this off before it got dark. And we had other things going on that I, you know, Lizzie had a wedding to get to and she had to hike off the mountain. <laughs> and so, so there's all these things that I've already calculated. And that was a, that was a thing that happened. So obviously, like I didn't take it lightly, but I said, okay, I'm going to process this tomorrow. I'm not going to let it, because the last thing I need is for the emotion that's linked with, with that thing that just happened. I can't let that get tangled up in the job that we have to do. Mm. So like it was the next day and when I saw the footage, it just made me sick, just like nauseous. Cause that could have been way, yeah. that, that could have been way worse. But yeah, and that's a situation we've- And he stuck his arm out. Oh yeah. Can you explain what happened maybe for your backstory? So or... they were doing a, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. But let's, I wanna hear your version of it. All right. <laughs> so they had a, a group of people in a group of vehicles going out to recover yeah. an airplane that had been forced down out in the bush. The airplane was whole, but tipped over. And so you had your crew, but then you had some people that just wanted to tag along. Well, I had I had my crew and we invite people that I trust in tonight. So we had the bleep and Jeep crew with us. We had um, Colt and Matt with us and, and uh, George. So we had that crew with us. I trust those guys, they can handle themselves. But the brother of the guy that put the plane down wanted to come up and watch. And he asked if he could tag along and I didn't have a problem with it. And he was a sort of a heavy set gentleman, a little, little, little bit. Yeah. He had like a one seater. So the, the narrow little razors, I don't know, they are the five so sixties or something. They they were climbing up something pretty you know, they're going up a steep hill and there was one of those corners where it's a little bit tippy and the guy got himself going over. And I don't know who saved him, but he started if he'd have rolled, he would have rolled down hundreds of feet. Oh yeah. You know, it yep. would have been tumbling. And he's an older gentleman and he stuck his arm out. So that arm would have been gone. Yeah. And Col Colt from Bleep and Jeep yelled out, put your, get your arm in or something like that. Arm in, arm in, arm in. And he pulled his arm in just before it went over his arm. And then it ended up against a rock. And the rock stopped it from yeah. going. And, and I wasn't there. He was the, the last one through. So we had to, we had to drive a Jeep back down there and, and flip him back up on the, you know, and get it up out of there. But, but that could have been a death. Yeah, it could have been a fatality Easy. easily. Easy. And a lot of the jobs that we're doing, the, the chance of there being a fatality is, is there. It's a real concern. Like even, even in this with Ed in there, it doesn't matter if we have our seatbelts on or not. Well, me, we, even with me in there today. Uh, today, all of these would have been flops. <laughs> it's when you're on the top of something. I, I, can't see yeah. good but you're up on I've top watched of this. a couple episodes and if you go if you go off you're not stopping yeah. until you get to the bottom and the seat belt's not going to change how that turns out for yeah. you in fact that's one of the few times when getting ejected from the vehicle increases your chances of survival so if you can get ejected and not crushed yes that's we're going and you'll see on a lot of these jobs that are really high like that I don't have my seat belt on and maybe it's only a 2% better chance of living, but I'll take that 2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's dangerous once those things start going. I mean, I've rolled over in a lot of cars in movies, so. But to, to put it in perspective though, off-road recovery guys, um, all of them that I know that do this dangerous stuff, 
I don't know of any, even any like serious injuries from any of them, but in the tow industry, tow truck drivers are getting struck and killed all the time. Mm. Um, changing a tire on the side of the freeway, give me the sketchiest off-road job in the world before you give me a Honda Civic yeah. with a flat tire on the freeway. So even driving here, it's a mess out there. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, I want to live. I want my crew to live. I don't want to endanger anybody's life. I don't want to take a risk that, you know, I'm not going to play with somebody's life like that. And sometimes on the videos, it's hard to tell the whole story of what's going on. So it may look like we're doing something very reckless or maybe we're doing something that's really, really sketchy and it just doesn't look that way um, because the camera's just not showing what's going on. But we are dealing with that and we do take it very serious. We kind of joke that, that safety is fourth and I don't even remember what it is it's like style functionality fun and then safety um, but if you if you do analyze it if you take the time to analyze it if safety is first and you're only doing using safety as the safest thing to keep you from getting bodily in, in, injury oftentimes that will completely stop something yeah. from getting done yeah so we do things that are dangerous um, we do things that could be considered not safe. They, they wouldn't be safe for a common person to just jump in and do it. It would be very dangerous for them to do that. You have to have the practical knowledge mm -hmm. and the experience. I explain it like there. flying a passenger airliner. If you put me in that seat, that's a very, very dangerous thing to do. But with a trained pilot in there, it's one of the, it's the safest mode of transportation on this planet. Um, so what we're doing, it's, it's kind of hard because I don't have a piece of paper that says, hey, I've graduated from off-road recovery safety school. I don't have that piece of paper, but that doesn't mean I don't have it. So it's practical knowledge. Practical, yep. It's practical knowledge. And it's not just you, but you're sharing it and you're creating an opportunity for a bunch of other people to get it, whether it's in your crew or for us at home watching. And yeah. I think John Wayne did that for a lot of people, whether it was in practical action or in uh, practical uh, uh, advice. Mm -hmm. uh, so his, you know, he, he, most of his lines had significant meaning. You know, like you're, he'd say to me, you're long on mouth and short on ears, which meant right. shut up and listen. Even, and it's something that's kind of not shown a lot in the in any of the genre today there's um there's movies of john wayne one of the one of them i'm thinking of the cowboys where john wayne isn't completely developed yet he learned something on that trip mm -hmm. Bef you know before everything fell apart he um his interactions with with some of the hired the, the guys that hired on he he his horizon in the video for me anyway they broadened a little bit and that's that's the way life is. Like, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. And if I would, if you were to see me 10 years ago, and then hold me by the same standard that you would hold me by today, I wouldn't measure up. And and that's something that you got to remember too. With my crew, with my with my boys, with my family, with people that I interact with, um, everybody has room to to grow. They have they they have time to to uh, to mature exp expand, and become yep. more seasoned. See see more of the big picture. And, and allowing people to do that. Um, I was telling you that on the way in there. I I allow everybody to have a life just as complicated and busy and full of things as my life is. And it's a lot harder to get offended when somebody ignores you or forgets about you or you know doesn't call when they say they're gonna call. If you realize, hey, I do that stuff too. And it's not personal. It's not, it's that's just because I'm busy and my life is complicated. And I think that's, that's something that's definitely helped me interact with people a lot better. Yeah, and that that's just, you know, we, we are all learning as we go through life. It's not a game of perfect. Yeah. But one thing that, that I get from your videos is that you're, you're constantly improving. I think as a country, we're constantly improving. We've never been perfect, and we won't ever be perfect, but we're constantly improving. It's the way I look at my father. It's the way I look at myself. It's a, you know, we're here to learn some stuff. And, and try to share the good parts. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we, I, and once again, the comments that come in on the, the, the comments on the videos, they're not a great 
metric for what's actually going on on your channel, but they are they are an indicator of how things are going. We, the the loudest people are the ones that are usually discontent for whatever reason. Um, they'll they'll have negative input or you know a negative outlook on what's happening, what I'm doing, and they'll make sure I know it. Um, but one of them that that come comes up and it used to come up a lot more on when I first started was people were like angry at the people that got stuck like somebody who doesn't even know the person that got stuck is is expressing anger like what an idiot what a stupid jerk I would have left them there um like I had one where this got recently where a gal was like is that gonna get me out she's talking to this and then she asked everybody on the crew she's like I don't know if that's gonna get me out do you think that's gonna be able to get me out and they all said don't worry about it you're just gonna get out Lots of comments on that from people that are like, I would have left her there. Why? What, you, why would you leave that, her that's there? Why, that's why you're a good example for people because you've gone beyond that and you're showing them something. Most of the people who are sitting there, I think commenting on social media are sitting there on their couch and they haven't taken the step to do something like you did. You went out and you found something that one, you're capable of doing, two, you're learning as you go. Three, you're sharing it with others and, and you've gotten off the couch and you're doing it. You didn't grow up in ideal circumstances. Right. You, you didn't have all this handed to you. Somebody didn't go, okay, now Matt, you're gonna run the off-road section of this thing and create, you know, you, you've built this. And uh, people who are sitting there commenting, haven't, haven't. And one thing that I take from your channel is the way that you communicate with Henri clients who, by the way, aren't getting charged very much for your help, <laughs> you know, and and two, the way you deal with your crew, it's it's uh, it's an inspiration to to watch that, and I learn from it. Well, thank you. What is that? It's a sonic boom. Oh like, yeah. Or or it could be bomb testing. Bomb testing? They do it around here? Well, close enough to here. Yeah, you can I hear it. I bet you that one. I bet you those are bombs. So, my dad made a film in St. George called The Conqueror. It was produced by Howard Hughes, and it's the like. The, the biggest flop of anything that he ever did. He plays Genghis Khan and it oh, yeah, did yeah. not yep, yep, work. Yep. I've but, seen it. But they were doing nuclear testing out here uh, during that filming and a bunch of people on that show got cancer and oh, died. Yeah, the downwind or um, stuff. Um, and yeah. I, I think that we, we don't really look at that as something that affected my father's cancer. It could have been, I don't know. But uh, anything go on here that you hear about from all that nuclear testing? Yeah, there's def there definitely was the downwinder stuff that happened here. Um, I don't, I, I haven't been like affected by it like real personally, but I do know that there are there are those here that did. Like, is there still ground that's sort of hot or water that's contaminated? That's, that's all going to be like in Area 51 and mm -hmm. out in that area. So, so that's all fenced off, heavily guarded, heavily monitored. I see. So you can't just go in there and roll around in the mm -hmm. sand and drink the water. That's good. No. Another thing we talked about um, was the uh, the Arizona Gap. What do you call it? The Arizona Strip. strip. The Arizona, Arizona strip. strip. Yep. So the Arizona Strip is is sort of the border of Arizona and Utah for yep. a stretch, and it still remains some of the most remote uh, and unpopulated. Uh, one of the most remote and unpopulated areas in the, in the continental United States. There is no live water on the Arizona Strip. Wow. There's none. And and so it just starts a couple miles this way, and then you go to the Grand Canyon. And so it's completely cut off from Arizona. Um, you have to drive through another state to get to it. And by, you know, motor vehicle, you could hike. So it's kind of, kind of the north side of the, the, whole the north, canyon. The whole yeah. north the northwest strip of Arizona there and uh, yeah it's it's pretty remote country you're you're gonna want to make a plan when you go out there but it's a place that you like mm -hmm. I love it out there yeah so I want to see that someday we've been all we've been all over it it's it's rich with you know the Native American history that's down there early mining history down there um, all that's it's just a neat place to go look and it's far enough out there that the vandals haven't got to it um it's not all trashed or anything you can go look at stuff there's a there's some mining trucks from 1927 that are sitting there one of them looks like maybe me and paul could get it wow. running and drive it out of there we'll have to get a helicopter and lift that thing out yeah the um you know another thing that would happen when my dad was coming out here with john ford and you know 
the 40s and 50s is you know they'd film on reservation and, and they um they had a great relationship with the navajo in fact john ford they made him a, an honorary navajo and gave him the steer skin with his name on it and uh uh, when when a when a production company would come to town like St. George in the 50s it, it now I think a lot of movie companies uh, have left a bad taste in people's mouths but when they would come in those days they brought uh, opportunity to the area and they embraced the community and the community embraced them I mean the town of St. George really embraced these film companies and most of what I read is pretty positive uh, from those days like they left the place better than they found it and especially for like the Navajo people they were in in a, a tough spot during the depression and those movie companies would roll into town and it, you know they made sure everybody got paid everybody got uh, employed I know they had if there was water issues they even built pipelines uh, to different reservations uh, they flew people out for medical help uh, and then uh, you know, both John Ford and my father were huge lover, lovers of uh, Native American art and culture. And I think some of that has been forgotten. On the, Like on the John Wayne side, you know, there's a new generation that somehow think he didn't get along or he wasn't right. appreciated there. And he really was. And they had a, a great working relationship. Uh, and that's all, all here in this area. Yeah. I know right over this hill is an amazing, you got the sand dunes that roll down to that. That, like there's that cliff and then what's what do you call that beyond there it's just open yeah that's all warner valley down there like everything you're looking at off of that cliff is arizona arizona yeah. well it's beautiful out there it's that's pretty the dramatic strip. yep pretty dramatic yeah so for you to be able to come out here make a living be outside no. do something fun and be with your friends is that's all you can ask for we're at like no, we're not. good because there's a recovery <laughs> Hey Johnny, I gotta call you back. Okay. Cause I'm with more important people than you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye. Well, I called you from out of the blue. You know, I literally drove into your your lot, and then it wasn't until I pulled in that I went, "Oh, I'm a fan now." Oh, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> they might just throw my ass out. You should here. see when a YouTuber meets another YouTuber. <laughs> We're like fanboying off of each other. <laughs> It's weird. Well, it's nice of you to welcome us. It's nice of you to do the podcast and show us some of the trails yeah. and share your crew with us. Thank you, Matt. Thank really you. appreciate it. Really appreciate your channel and uh, what you guys put out there. Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go. Okay, we'll take this out on the test drive, right?